Welcome to the story. I'm David Molko in for Pat Doris. If you're in your living room watching right now or maybe streaming us a little bit later on your laptop in bed, hey, no judgment here. Just take a look around though. You'll likely see some photos, some art or some sort of object that brings back memories. If you were like me, you might surround yourself with things that lift you up, but whatever the feelings, sunshine or sorrow and lots in between, hey, they're all valid, right? Chances are those memories endure. So tonight, a little bit of history, a whole lot of memories, and that makes up tonight's big story. And so we begin two and a half days into 2023 when smoke and flames filled the sky in downtown Portland as a church that stood on the corner of Southwest 10th and Clay for more than a century began to burn on fire at the hands of an arsonist. Then three days after the building was torched, essentially little could be saved. You see it here as demolition crews brought that charred shell crashing to the ground. Now that particular church had been vacant for years. Its last tenant was the Portland Korean Church, whose congregation sold that building in 2015. Squatters took over and you saw how that all eventually ended. OK, a week after the demolition, we brought you a story from a woman whose family walked under that very steeple for three generations and how it was a cultural cornerstone for so many Korean immigrants and their families. More, much more than just a church. We also got in touch with the Oregon Historical Society to see if they had any resources that could help us tell that history. So here we go again. It all started in the 1870s with a reverend who wanted to start German missionary work in Portland. In 1877, that reverend gave his first sermon in the basement of the English Presbyterian Church at 3rd and Washington. Yeah, that is not the same intersection or the same church, but bear with us here. The sermon, by the way, in German. From there, the congregation grew in late 1879. A church building for those congregants was dedicated to get them out of the Presbyterian basement but soon the congregation, as they sometimes do, outgrew that small wooden structure. Finally, in 1905, a new church was built, and that was the building that stood in Portland for 118 years. Now, following our segment on the history of the church back in January, we asked you to share your thoughts and your memories, and we got plenty of calls just like this. Thank you for the wonderful follow-up story on the church at 10th and Clay. That was a beautiful piece. Thank you. You're very welcome from the entire team. There was one voicemail, though, in particular that really got our team's attention. Take a listen. Hey there, Pat. Uh, this is uh, Mike in Northeast Portland uh, calling because I just saw the story on the church and the uh, background with the uh, German history. Uh, I've got a close family friend, Mariel Bernhard. She's from the uh, Helen Bernhard Bakery family. Uh, lifelong Oregonian and long, long time uh, Portland resident. And when we saw the church burn down, she was telling us all these, my wife and I telling us all these stories uh, about her time at the church. Just thought maybe you should get in touch with her if you're going to continue to do any stories. I bet she'd love to talk to you all if you're going to do any more kind of oral history stories on that stuff. Oh, with a message like that, what did the team here at the story do? Well, we called Muriel to hear her story. Here's Pat Doris. Once a week, Grandpa would take his produce and sell it to uh, a member of the church that had a grocery store. And other members bought his stuff uh, also. For and, Mariel Bernhard's family, the church building on Southwest 10th and Clay was as much about faith and worship as it was business. It wasn't just Grandpa riding into town. Uncles got roped in, too. He remembers at 15 that he would drive himself with the, the horse and the buggy and um, bring the produce to also. It was a family affair, yes. Her grandparents immigrated from Germany, first to Iowa, then settled in the Stafford area of present-day Clackamas County. Muriel's father was the youngest of eight children. While the church offered up good business, it was also where several of the first-generation Americans and their children found love. Let's see. One, two, three, four, and then five. And tied the knot. Muriel and her late husband, David Bernhard, were married inside the church on October 28, 1967. My wedding dress was made by a, a, a German lady. Um, the veil 
was bought in Nuremberg, and so was my rings. <laughs> and that's where their journey at the building on 10th and Clay began. Let me see. Drawn this, by the sounds. They had a beautiful pipe organ. Oh. The sermons and family. They had the, a good choir and they had the good preacher. And so mm, my uh, couple of uncles were still going there. So I was greeted by my uncle Carl and, you know, welcomed and, <laughs> and I felt at home. And the pipe organ, there was a beautiful pipe organ player. And the church was ringing with this pipe organ sound. And um, I was just so happy to be there. And um, the, the stained glass windows, I always love stained glass. Um, and the, be the beauty of those were the main point of the church. According to the superintendent of the Pacific Conference of the Evangelical Church, the stained glass windows were made by the Portland-based Povey Brothers, known as the Tiffany of the Northwest. Yeah. The Bernhards quickly got involved in church operations, far more than just your Sunday regulars. Mariel taught Sunday school and began playing that pipe organ she loved. David became treasurer. We have three children, but the first one was born there and um, was dedicated there. Um, we sang in the choir, my husband and I, and it was a very beautiful choir. Life was good at 10th and Clay, but in the 1980s, the congregation got smaller and smaller. We were a downtown church, and people had to come to the church there. And as the people got older and their children left and to other cities and other states, um, the congregation dwindled down. And Eventually, church leaders, including treasurer David Bernhardt, made the tough decision to sell. It was very, very sad for us to leave the memories and, uh, and uh, all that. We, we wished it would have grown, <laughs> but it didn't. The building was sold to the Portland Korean Church, who worshipped there for years. It made my heart feel good that another church was using it. But of course, we all know this history does not have a happy ending. Oh, it just, uh, the, the memories in my mind just went <laughs> lickety split as I saw the fire destroying the top of the church. Um, and then, oh, it just broke my heart. <laughs> And I saw these claws going into the stained glass window. And I just saw this stained glass window going down. Oh, I cried. <laughs> it was very an emotional time for me. Not all of the stained glass is gone for good. When the congregation left downtown in the 80s, they took one of the precious panes with them. The one surviving piece of Povey Brothers stained glass now serves the Tualatin Valley Community Church in Aloha. Even though the building on 10th and Clay is no more, former congregants like 83-year-old Mariel Bernhard know it's the spiritual legacy that lives on. I can just say my faith was, was grown there, and um, now I'm old, and <laughs> my faith is still strong because of the ministry of that church. Laughing and crying at the same time there. Okay, you may have caught this in that voicemail earlier, the one that clued us into the story, especially if you live in Northeast Portland. Mariel is connected to the Helen Bernhard Bakery on Northeast Broadway. Her late husband, David's grandmother, was the Helen Bernhardt who started that business in 1924. Here's a look at Helen from Muriel and David's wedding photos. The business went from Helen to her son Ben to his son David, who did some of the baking himself. Now, David sold that place in 1988, and even though the family ownership changed, the name has remained. So when our team visited earlier this year, Helen Bernhard's bakery was still bustling, now in its 99th year of business. How about that? We'd love to hear any of your memories involving the church, or maybe you have some about the bakery. Just send an email to the story at kgw.com or call and leave a voicemail. Yes, the team listens to them all. That magic number again, 503-226-5090.
All right, this next story. These are the moments we love to bring you the ones that end in a win for everyone, essentially. In this case, a group of seniors who are fighting to stay in their low income apartments in Tiger because it appears they have now won an unlikely victory. All right, here is the backstory. Residents at the Wood Spring Apartments say they recently found out their rent was about to take a tremendous jump at the end of the year after the property's 30 year low income tax credit status expired, allowing the owner, a private equity investment firm in San Francisco, to legally raise those rents to market rate after decades, right? A hike that many of those residents who thought they'd already moved for the last time said they just simply could not afford. All right, with state help in the form of a loan, Washington County says it plans to buy the property and keep those units affordable for those seniors. It is not quite a done deal, though. We're going to get there in just a moment. But first, our Alma McCarty caught up with some of those seniors last night, and let's just say they were thrilled. On a sunny afternoon in Tigard, Wood Spring apartment tenants celebrated a victory. I made this a home, you know, even though it's an apartment complex, this is home. This is just the biggest win for everybody. It's just the biggest relief that you could possibly hope for. And I thank God. The vote by Washington County commissioners to purchase the low income complex from a private investment company means this group can stay together. That's unanimous, so it, it's approved. Thank you. The Woodspring Tenants Association has advocated for this action since 2021 when they first got word that their affordable rent had an expiration date. We got this notice on the door that said, oh, happy new year, we're going market rate. I can't believe the callousness of this. Two years of organizing later, tenants can rest easier after the county's decision. We won at this point, and it means a lot because there's so many people in here. It's such a great little neighborhood. We don't have to worry about moving. We don't have to worry about the rent being so high that none of us can afford it. When we heard that news, it was like, oh, thank God, because I, ca I cannot move again. I just cannot move again. That could have been the reality for many residents, including Peggy Hepler. She's lived at Woodspring since 2015. I fell in love with the place right off the bat. After a bad car wreck last summer, she leaned on this community while she recovered. I don't know how I would do this without my neighbors. The loss of that devastating to think about. These last couple of years have been so stressful. When you're on Social Security only and it keeps going up and up and your money is going down and down because what their percentage of increase on your Social Security isn't even close to what the rent <laughs> increase is and it's like, OK, what can I do without? The county's agreement to purchase the property means Woodspring will remain affordable. When I moved in here. I planned to live here until they carried me out. And this has been the greatest day that we could ever have. In Tigard, Alma McCarty, KGW News. And you know what? We are cheering all of you on. This is not a done deal just yet, so let's tell you where things stand. The Housing Authority in Washington County had a consultant send the current owners of the property, that private equity firm in San Francisco, a non-binding letter of intent to purchase. The property was appraised for $46.6 million, even though that was less than the owner's asking price. The owners accepted the non-binding letter and have since proposed a purchase and sale agreement. Now, the Housing Authority is negotiating with the owners over that agreement. The goal, the county says, to execute the deal in a way that keeps those units affordable. As for where the money's coming from, the plan is to take $4 million from the local Housing Authority fund, finance the rest through a mortgage and a hefty, hefty loan from the Oregon Housing and Community Services Department. On average in America, women have to work 15 months to earn the same amount that men earn in a year. So even with new laws and changes and awareness, why is there still a pay gap? We'll dig into the data that's driving those concerns when the story returns.
Welcome back. Tuesday marked something called Equal Pay Day in the U.S. That is a date that women have to work until in order to make the same amount of money men made last year. In other words, women have to work more than 15 months to earn what a man makes in 12. That is according to the National Committee on Pay Equity, which gets its data from the U.S. Census. Now, nationally, women only earn about 82 cents for every dollar a man makes. That gap is even wider when you factor in things like race. Here is something else. The disparity has hardly shrunk at all in the last 20 years. Let's show you a graph from the Pew Research Center. The gap was starting to close in the 80s. See it narrowing there and then basically flatlined in the 2000s. That is despite the fact that more women are graduating college than men. Now, six years ago, Oregon passed the pay equity bill. It was meant to address that gap in the state. It requires both public and private employers to ensure their employees are being paid equitably. Men and women doing the same job are supposed to be paid the same. Of course, there is a little bit of wiggle room. There are exceptions for things like education, experience level, and seniority, and it allows employees to sue if their employers aren't paying them fairly. It's been six years since that law was passed, so the question is, has it worked? How has it worked? Now, here's what the Oregon Secretary of State's office says about a new report on the state's government workforce. The report did find significant pay gaps still exist within the state workforce, despite recent good faith efforts by state leaders to address these pay inequities. So there's more work to be done. Significant pay gaps, he said. So the audit division looked at data from 2015 before the law passed and 2022 and found that women working for the state of Oregon are still being paid only 83 cents on the dollar that men are paid. That's the same as it was in 2015. People of color are also earning less than white people, about 91 cents for every dollar. In other words, a gap hadn't really changed in seven years. Wage gaps can have a significant impact on people's lives. For, exa for example, a woman would need to work nearly 44 years to earn the same amount a man earns in 30 years, based on the average wage gap since 1960. Although wage gaps have improved, women and people of color must still work years longer to earn the same amount of money. Some perspective for you there. The audits team says they still have more to study so they can figure out why that pay gap exists in state government. But they suspect one reason could be that women tend to have less seniority than their male, male counterparts because they're often still the ones who are expected to leave work and handle things like child care for their families. National researchers agree with that. Here's a senior researcher from the Pew Research Center. Yes, that has something to do with it. There are social and cultural norms at work. And in an accompanying survey we did, in fact, women are much more likely to say that they feel greater responsibility to take care of family needs by a much greater margin than men. Well, according to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, more than a million women are still missing from the workforce since before the pandemic in large part because of those expectations. The number of working women is down a full percentage point since January of 2020 and overwhelmingly among parents surveyed. It is because of the need for child care. The auditor said they weren't sure why there is still such a big gap between people of color and white workers, though. All in all, the auditors concluded that despite Oregon's pay equity law, you heard it, more work needs to be done to close that gap. Well, up next on the story, they are hands down the stars of the ocean floor, though some species are struggling with a mysterious disease that has puzzled biologists for nearly a decade. Now, Oregon researchers have developed a breakthrough treatment to help sick sea stars recover and thrive. Environmental reporter Kale Williams shows us how when the story returns.
It'd be great to see some of these vacant buildings turned into housing so they can help the homeless people get off the streets. Ahead at 630, a frustrating site. Buildings sitting vacant for months, even years, with housing, specifically affordable housing, so hard to come by. Coming up on KGW News, see how Portland just made it easier for developers to turn former office spaces into places to call home. Right now, back to the story. All right, thanks for sticking with us. Doing double duty tonight. Let's head west to the Oregon Coast Aquarium in Newport, where one researcher has made a significant breakthrough on a medical mystery that has been puzzling marine biologists for years. Now, nearly a decade ago, sea stars, what some folks used to call starfish, were nearly wiped out along much of the West Coast by an illness called sea star wasting disease. Now, experts still don't understand the cause, but now they believe they found a treatment to help them revive and even survive. Kale Williams with the story. Experts have been trying to figure out what killed all the sea stars for years. Around 2013, you can see they simply began wasting away, losing limbs and dissolving into the ocean. Many species, including the sunflower sea star, which can grow up to three feet wide with as many as 24 arms, have nearly disappeared from the waters off the west coast. Tiffany Rudek, an aquarist at the Oregon Coast Aquarium in Newport, has seen the disease even kill several of the stars at the aquarium, and none of their previous treatments were working. I was pretty determined that I was going to figure an alternative out, um, and so I started looking at things very differently. She began poring over the research and talking to everyone she could about a different approach. Instead of looking to treat specific symptoms, Rudek began trying to create an environment optimal for sea stars to heal. So it's really, really focused on essentially putting the star in like an equilibrium state. At the very first sign of symptoms, sea stars are quarantined away from other animals. Then... The, the very first thing we do with a star when we know that it's sick um, is we take it and we give it a bath in this iodine-based solution. Then Rudek prepares a tank with the sea star's optimal environment. She keeps the water temperature cold, adjusts the pH levels to avoid parasites, and adds a concoction of minerals that help the sea stars recover. Essentially, we're kind of making like a vitamin cocktail specific to sea stars. Rudek says that often, they see signs of improvement almost immediately. They're kind of twisted up usually and very unhappy looking, and then they go in the bath and they just kind of relax. And, and it's worked over the long term, too. So far, 15 of the 17 stars they've treated have fully recovered. And... Um, the first first few trials that we did, they worked and they worked really well, better than anything we've seen before. And we were like, oh, OK, this is amazing. While it would be impossible to recreate the treatment in the open ocean, Rudex said her regimen will still benefit wild sea stars, especially as other researchers work to breed the animals in captivity and release them back into the wild. It could potentially have a lot of big, big, wide applications. Kale Williams, KGW News. I always love science stories. Okay, on a related note, just today, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA for short, announced they'd taken the first steps toward listing the sunflower sea star as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. There is a year-long process to follow here, but if that happens, it could mean more federal money to study what's been killing those creatures and how best to help them recover. All right, keep sending your questions and comments to the story at KGW.com. Keep it right here. I am with you all the way through seven. We have got one final update from Pat Doris on his Eastern Oregon listening tour right after this.
Hey guys, today I'm in Prairie City, Oregon, just outside of John Day, but they have a delightful school here, kindergarten through the 12th grade. And so we've come here to talk about the cultural differences between the east side and the west side. And there's some things that are very common that we found here that are also on the west side, but there's a lot of really unique things as well. So also met some great folks here, looking forward to introducing you to them, but it's part of our Eastern Oregon listening tour. And today we've been in Prairie City. All right, Pat is now making his way back. He'll be back here on the story tomorrow night. That wraps up the story for this Wednesday. I've got your headlines up next. Plus, Matt has a seven day forecast I think is worth celebrating small victories, right? The news at 630 starts.